It is late April 1862. Following the Union's decisive yet costly victory at the Battle of Shiloh, Major General Henry Wager Halleck, commanding the Union's Department of the Mississippi, arrives at Pittsburgh Landing to assume overall command of his forces. Comprised of three field armies, the Army of the Tennessee under Major General Ulysses S. Grant, the Army of the Ohio under Major General Don Carlos Buell, and the Army of the Mississippi under Major General John Pope, recently promoted following his decisive victory at the Battle of Island No. 10. Despite claiming victory from the jaws of defeat, it is not easy for Halleck's soldiers to feel optimistic after the bloody Battle of Shiloh. It has been a wet spring, and the constant rains have turned the Pittsburgh Landing battlefield into a muddy quagmire of horror. The wounded, sick, and dead lay mingled in the mud. The sights, smells, and sounds are sickening. Burial parties are everywhere. Wagons and open pits are full of corpses. Summon up the aftermath of Shiloh in the days after the battle, one soldier said, War is hell broke loose. Halleck's arrival at Pittsburgh Landing in the weeks after Shiloh signals a new beginning of the federal campaign. He sees his task as similar to the situation in Missouri after he had taken over from Major General John C. Fremont, cleaning up a mess. This time, however, it is, to him, Grant's mess. He evaluates Don Carlos Buell's Army of the Ohio, which had joined Grant's Army of the Tennessee on the second day at Shiloh, as being in good condition. But he cascades Grant's force as, without discipline and order. Immediate and active measures must be taken to put your command in condition to resist another attack by the enemy, he berates Grant. He also orders Major General Pope to bring his army of the Mississippi immediately to Shiloh. Large reorganizations are unfolding at Pittsburgh Landing in the weeks after Shiloh. Halleck, whose military department is geographically the largest under federal jurisdiction, is now organizing what will become the Young War's largest military force. He takes three armies and merges them into a single unit of more than 100,000 men. The collection of officer talent that leads these troops is similarly impressive. In addition to Halleck, Grant, Buell, and Pope, there is George H. Thomas, William T. Sherman, William Rosecrans, Philip Sheridan, James B. McPherson, John McClernand, John A. Logan, James A. Garfield, William Bull Nelson, Jefferson C. Davis, and Lew Wallace. On April 30th, Halleck establishes three wings of his new army. The right wing, under Thomas, consisting of four divisions from the Army of the Tennessee and one division from the Army of the Ohio. The center wing, under Buell, consisting of four divisions from the Army of the Ohio, and the left wing, under Pope, made up of four divisions from the Army of the Mississippi. The reserve, under McClernand, consists of two Army of the Tennessee divisions and one from the Army of the Ohio. Grant becomes second in overall command. Halleck always insisted that he made this assignment because Grant's rank required it, but in fact he does not trust Grant and wants to keep a close eye on him. Halleck later said of Grant, I never saw a man more deficient in the business of organization. Brave and able in the field, he has no idea of how to regulate and organize his forces before a battle or to conduct the operations of a campaign. Facing this massive Union Army is General PGT Beauregard's still recovering Army of Mississippi. After the loss at Shiloh on April 7th, it had staggered back to Corinth, leaving scattered along the roads everything from blankets to tent poles, muskets to broken wagons. The original commander, Albert Sidney Johnston, had died in battle, and Beauregard, who had replaced him, had not inspired immediate confidence by ordering an end to the first day's attack. During that evening, Buell had arrived and Grant had reorganized, and the revitalized Union Army had swept the Confederates off the field on the second day. Beauregard recognizes how shattered his troops are and calls for reinforcements. 
when the long-awaited Major General Earl Van Dorn with his Army of the West arrives from across the Mississippi River in mid-April. His command consists of only about 14,000 men. Beauregard adds these soldiers to his own 30,000 and scrapes together others from all over the Confederacy to create a respectable force of 70,000 with which to face Halleck's 100,000. Unfortunately for him, nearly 20,000 Confederates are suffering from wounds or disease. Beauregard does, however, have many well-known generals in his officer corps, including Earl Van Dorn, Lee Nyes Polk, William Hardy, Braxton Bragg, John C. Breckinridge, Mansfield Lovell, and Sterling Price. Corinth, where the Confederate Army is entrenched, is not a large city. Incorporated in 1856, it was originally named Cross City because the East-West Memphis and Charleston Railroad and the North-South Mobile and Ohio Railroad were slated to intersect there in the near future. When the Civil War began, Corinth was still a small village with a population of only 1,000. Once the fighting started, the city became a rallying point for troops and supplies. When Albert Sidney Johnston and his army arrives there after the fall of Forts Henry and Donelson in February 1862, the city gained more than 40,000 new military residents, numbers of whom were already ill or became ill and died. Corinth resembles a huge hospital and morgue, entrenchments protecting the city begun under Bragg's direction prior to Shiloh, now stretched into 10 miles of mounded clay and lumber. They reinforce the natural defenses of the swamps and the flooded streams. They run out of coffins because of the huge number of deaths, but there is always plenty of clay to dig and pile up. The terrain that separates the Union Army at Pittsburgh Landing and the Confederate Army some 22 miles away in Corinth is rolling, wooded, and in places swampy and traversed by streams and roads. These bodies of water are hardly imposing enough to stop an advancing army but they are robust enough, particularly because of the wet spring, to make land approaches swampy and water crossings difficult. There are several roads leading into the city. A direct road runs from Pittsburgh Landing to Corinth, first passing through Monterey 10 miles out, and then continuing for another 9 miles into the former Cross City. This is a route that the right wing follows. The center wing follows the Purdy Farmington Road, while the left wing falls along the Hamburg-Corinth Road, which passes through Farmington. Rain is a major problem, resulting in a flood that carries away bridges and creating mud that slows traffic to an exhausting crawl. One rainy day, General Pope almost loses his boots in slogging through the mud to get to Halleck's tent. Future President James Garfield, currently a Brigadier General serving under Buell's staff, bemoans how the successions of heavy rains made camp life in these woods very uncomfortable. Soldiers have to clear numerous trees the Confederates had dropped in the army's path, and they also corduroy roads through the swamps. It is a difficult existence. Inexorably, however, Union troops are bearing down on the Mississippi-Tennessee border in a line almost 12 miles wide. They expect a major battle soon a repeat of the horror of Shiloh. However, it will not be so. The Siege of Corinth, also known in retrospect as the First Battle of Corinth, begins on April 29, 1862, when the first federal units reach the outskirts of the city's defensive lines. Rumors of Confederate activity fills the air, influencing the generals and the lowliest privates alike. Still, by May 3rd, Pope's wing is only a mile and a half from Farmington, which is a scant four miles from Corinth. Slowing its progress, however, is a swollen creek to the front, which is described as an impregnable jungle and swamp to the left. Pope also worries that Buell, on his right, is not keeping up. During the same time, 
Thomas's right wing advances beyond Monterey until Rain stops any further movement. Sherman, who commands a division in the right wing, describes the situation in a circular to his soldiers. Our situation from the rain and road has become difficult, and it becomes the duty of every officer and man to anticipate our danger and labor. Every ounce of food and forage must be regarded as precious as diamonds. General Halleck and our superior officers will do all they can, but their power is limited by nature. The weather turns briefly hot and dry, and the army begins a siege of Corinth, what one soldier terms the first epistle to the Corinthians. Soldiers on both sides had predicted a quick fight. Union troops had believed they would be marching into Corinth by May 2nd. This was not to be. Horrible weather and subsequent widespread illness has played a role in this slow movement, but Halleck is the primary reason for the stalled advance. He is the authority on military theory, and his book calls for massing troops and winning victories through maneuver and numerical superiority. He had also been Dennis Hart Mahon's star pupil at West Point, and like Mahon, he is a great admirer of the French doctrine that emphasizes the necessity of field fortifications, particularly for amateur soldiers like the ones that comprise his massive army. So he digs in at every chance he has. The memory of the recent surprise Confederate attack at Shiloh only makes his orders regarding entrenchments more insistent. He masses, he inches forward, he worries and he entrenches. On the battlefield, however, Halleck's army continues moving forward. He keeps his forces massed, constantly worried about Beauregard's Confederates flanking him on his right or finding a gap between two wings. He knows that he has to keep watch on Pope and his left wing in particular, as Pope displays an aggressiveness that concerns Halleck. On May 3rd, Pope moves one of his divisions forward toward Farmington, only four miles from Corinth. Instead of ordering the center and right wings to align with Pope's advanced left wing, Halleck orders Pope back to his original place. Four days later, on May 7th, Pope requests permission to send forward a reconnaissance force to investigate the recurring rumor that the Confederates were evacuating Corinth. Halleck agrees and offers support from Buell's center wing. However, the very next day, he orders Pope to avoid any general engagement as he is unsure that Buell has received his own orders for support. However, Pope claims that by now it is too late to avoid engaging the enemy. He reports that the Confederates had launched their own attack and are driving his pickets in. After hearing this, Halleck then changes his mind regarding Pope's orders, stating he is unsure of the situation in the field. The Confederate resistance proves to be feeble for the Union commanders. Pope deduces that they are either evacuating Corinth or that they are trying to draw the Federals out onto the road. What Pope and Halleck are unaware of, however, is that the Confederates have in fact botched a planned attack and were now withdrawn back into their entrenchments. The fog of war looms heavily over the Federals at the start of the siege. By mid-May, Halleck's army is located within two to three miles of Corinth. Beauregard is still planning an attack on the encroaching Union forces. Still undeterred by his botched movement against Pope at Farmington, he implements a new plan, this time to have his entire army go on the offensive. Once again, though, the strike never materializes, since General Van Dorn, whose command is scheduled to lead off the assault on May 22nd, fails to move on time for the attack. If Pope displayed an unwavering propensity for moving forward, Grant has an even more daring idea. Thinking long and hard, he finally gets up the nerve to suggest to Halleck that he order Pope to pull his left wing out of line, march it behind the center and right wings, and attack the Confederate left along a ridge there. Grant insists that a stream and multiple swamps already protect Pope's position, as it only needs pickets to defend it. Meanwhile, in Corinth, 
the Confederates are constructing their own permanent breastworks, which are even more formidable than those the Union Army is constructing daily. The Confederates regularly hear rumors of a Union attack, some whispering to each other that Halleck has troops to the rear at Tupelo. While Halleck repeatedly expresses concerns about a Confederate attack on his right and experiences minor combat on his left, Beauregard is worried about flanking movements like the one Grant had suggested. He also realizes that Halleck is drawing ever closer to the Confederate defensive lines with his siege tactics. If he breached the entrenchments, he could capture not only the city and the railroads going through it, but also Beauregard's army. The Louisiana general had to do something. On May 25th, Beauregard calls in his corps commanders. He is running out of water for his soldiers and draft animals, and the unhealthy conditions are resulting in burgeoning levels of ill health. He still wants to attack the Union Army, but he cannot see how to breach Halleck's entrenchments without incurring major casualties. He hates to admit to himself and his officers that the only viable option that remains is to abandon Corinth and save the army to fight another day. For most of the campaign, the Union Army had heard railroad trains entering and leaving the city on a regular basis. For several days in late May, some of Logan's men put their ears to the rails and can tell there is increased railroad activity. Beauregard is up to something, but Halleck does not know what. Sherman offers to send troops forward to find out, but after Halleck gives him permission, he then wavers, saying, If not too late, hold your position. If, however, you consider the risk too great, fall back. Of all the Union generals, the aggressive Pope is particularly nervous about Confederate intentions. He had, after all, already been the target of several attacks, so he wants to make sure he knows what is going on to his front. On May 27th, he tells Halleck that a woman who lives within sight of one of the railroads is sure that Beauregard's army is planning a withdrawal toward Memphis, Tennessee. Soon after, though, Pope changes his mind and insists that Beauregard's men are massing to his front, and he expects an all-out attack. The noise coming out of Corinth is increasingly disconcerting to him. Pope writes to Halleck of his worries that the Confederates are preparing to make a move. Halleck reacts immediately. He tells Buell, in the center of the Federal Siege Works, to be ready to support Pope when he comes under attack. After sending these orders to Buell, however, Halleck receives a new dispatch from Pope, who claims that he is now certain Beauregard is planning a withdrawal from Corinth. With the fog of war shrouding their situation, Halleck is unsure what to believe. He writes, Reports from Corinth respecting the enemy's movement are so conflicting, it is very difficult to fix definitely now our plans. However, he finally decides that an enemy attack is imminent. It turns out that just the opposite is happening. On May 30th, rather than massing to attack Halleck's army, Beauregard's force is abandoning Corinth. He uses the trains to evacuate his incapacitated men and his supplies, but he makes it seem as though reinforcements are actually pouring in. Every time an empty train rumbles into the city to evacuate wounded and sick soldiers, and much needed supplies. Beauregard has healthy soldiers cheer on though the train has just brought in new troops. A regimental band plays festive music. Fake deserters are sent to the Union lines to tell false tales, and wooden or Quaker guns replace real ones in the entrenchments. Beauregard uses every trick he can think of to fool Halleck. The Confederates evacuate Corinth before the Federals know what has happened. The Union troops eventually march into the abandoned fortifications that evening with no Confederate soldiers in sight, and the Quaker guns standing as a silent rebuke to Union timidity. The siege of Corinth is over. Even though Beauregard's army has escaped, Halleck has taken Corinth. Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, not one of Halleck's fans, caused the city's capture a brilliant and successful achievement. Halleck himself is thrilled with what he considers his great accomplishment. 
His book on military theory emphasizes the importance of gaining control of strategic places. To him, capturing armies is not important. So to Halleck, his capture of Corinth with its strategic north-south and east-west railroads is a major victory, no matter that Beauregard has escaped. And he has done it all, he tells his wife, with very little loss of life. I have won the victory without the battle. Even more inspiring, his men have given him a nickname in honor of his achievement. They begin calling him Old Brains, a name he carries from that time on. Halleck's officers, including Grant, are similarly pleased with the victory and extol him as a military genius. Sherman says that Corinth is a victory as brilliant and important as any recorded in history. Halleck had said on May 25th that Richmond and Corinth are now the great strategical points of war, and he had now captured one of them. At the same time, McClellan's attempt to take Richmond remains bogged down on the Virginia Peninsula. Newspapers might criticize Halleck, and some soldiers might grumble, but Old Brains had done what he had set out to do. It apparently did not matter that he does not follow up the victory, and instead breaks up his vast army in the siege's aftermath. And so, for the next three months after the Union victory at Corinth, the Western Theater remains relatively quiet. Instead, national attention begins to shift back towards the Eastern Theater and Virginia, where Major General George B. McClellan's Army of the Potomac is finally advancing against Richmond.